Hello and welcome to episode 520 of Ferg on the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. Join me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? Going pretty well, Andrew. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Um, it's like the good old days where we recorded all the time, hey? Yeah, it's it three episodes in four or five days, something Yeah, like. it's been great. Yeah. Maybe one of us has become unemployed. <laughs> have you got something to tell me have you <laughs> well tell you what we're not going to muck around here i know of a place where there's a job opening at the moment and well I've, I've, look i've got the uh I'd say physique but i've definitely got the mass <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. well we had uh a bombshell news mm. today that was kept really really quiet by everyone which was like, I was impressed by how quiet it was kept until it was announced. And that announcement is that James Fisher-Harris has been released from the last two years of his contract at the Penrith Panthers, and he's going home to play for the New Zealand Warriors. He's already got a four-year deal that starts there from next year. Um, and great signing for them, massive loss for the Panthers. He was homesick, apparently, wanted to go home. And, you know, I, you can't begrudge him that but a massive loss for, them that, for the Panthers. And it really feels like this is, for all the players they've lost, this really feels like a proper giant, how do you replace that foundation piece? Oh, absolutely. It's um, The Panthers have got a very, very specific forward pack, mm-hmm. and it's phenomenal. Um, and a lot of it is built around their, we'll use the term that we don't like, their middle forwards. Mm-hmm. Not so much their second rows. Mm-hmm. So it's all about the holes they're punching through the middle. Um, and Fisher Harris was indeed the spearhead of that. So they're going to be looking for a very specific type of front rower, um, one with a good a good motor on him, so good good fitness, able to do, you know, fifty minutes is the absolute minimum mm-hmm. that they have to be able to do. Um, they're not going to want someone old and experienced because that's not who they buy. No. Um, and they're going to want someone who is genuinely rep quality. Yeah, yeah. Not a – you're casting a pretty narrow net there. There's not a huge number of prop forwards who are going to fit that sort of, um, you know, description, I guess, at this stage, who also aren't going to break your bank. Yeah, because, I mean, James Fisher-Harris, he wasn't on like a million bucks or anything like that. He was on a nice amount. Yeah, and you know the numbers that Penrith put up when he's off the field compared to when he's on the field, it's very different. Like, and you, it's very dramatic. Like, you know, you can see teams start scoring points when he goes off the field, and it stops as soon as he turns back up on the field after his rest. So, replacing that, and apart from that, he's a really good leader. He's a very level-headed sort of dude. He's a you know, a kind of a quiet sort of leader as well, which I think works well with a, a younger side, although the Panthers side is starting to starting to get a little bit away from being such a young side, but they're still compared to a lot of teams, they're still a young side. Um, I don't think you can replace it. I don't think you can get a like for like. I think what they will maybe try and do is they've got Liam Henry there who's played very well. This is really his first full season of being a first grader as a prop, and he looks pretty good, actually. He doesn't look out of place when he's on the field for the Panthers. He's come through their system, and they'll obviously have players in their system ready to come up and and get their chance. But I think that they would be looking for the sort of player who, as you say, is rep quality, prop forward, they're only going to spend the money if it's a, a a really high quality player. I don't think they're just going to, you know, slot someone in there and hope it works. They they're going to get somebody that's a real good player, and I think it's going to have to be the sort of player that sees an opportunity there at Penrith and says, you know what, I'll take a little bit less money to walk into this team, and I if I I feel as though I can keep keep things going forward. Now they've been linked already to uh Stefan Itakamanu, 
um, for the West Tigers. Yep. I know. I think I think I've got his name wrong there, but uh, you 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 take a Manu. Yeah, you take a Manu. Um, um, very very good forward and. I mean, he's been playing very consistently good for the Tigers, even when they've been poor. Yeah. He's often been one of their better players the whole way through. Um, so already he's got everything that they're looking for. Big dude as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, and a good motor on him. So he he does tick all the boxes. He's got it. And look, this has all just happened, so you never know what's going to happen. He might get a contract extension from the West Tigers tomorrow. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but apparently he's got a get-out clause in his contract, and part of the get-out clause is if they don't make, if the West Tigers don't make the finals, which whoever put that in his clause is, I mean, that's indicative of the, the, last, um, the last administration of the West Tigers. Like, they're giving those sorts of clauses out, to play as well, they're winning wooden spoons. That's really smart. But the other one is, and, and these are the things that can let him get out of his contract early, by the way. So uh, miss out in the top eight. The other one is if he plays um, two or more state of origin games, which that's a that's a fifty fifty bet. Yeah, and that's the one that's going to be that could go either way. Um. And you even, know, it's like if if I said to you, how much money would you put on Nathan Cleary playing two State of Origin games this year? It's not like it's a hundred percent that he's going to definitely do it. And there's a lot of very good forwards for New South Wales, so Michael Maguire being the coach will probably help his chances. But, yeah, it's true. I mean, that's it's still it's not the easiest thing for him to do. No, God no. Um, I've only just been thinking about this on, you know, within the last hour, really, about, you know, yeah. what their options are. Yeah. And I I wouldn't be surprised, and this is me just spitballing here, because that's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Chances of moving Liam Martin into the front row. Okay. And the reason why I say this is that they are almost, he and Liam Martin and James Fischer, Fisher Harris are almost identical in size. Yeah. Very similar playing style. They play hard, they play straight, mm-hmm. good defenders. Um and I think that adds a little bit more freedom to the Panthers when it comes to who's who they recruit, because if they can't find the front rower that they want, maybe they just need to find a second rower that can fill Liam Martin's role and Martin can move over. Yeah, that's possible. Um, I had and Martin, somebody Martin has played in the middle before too. He's yeah. not not a lot, but he has done it. So we, it's not a mad idea. No, no. And, and like he's probably, I mean, oh, Martin, they play him on the edges because he does have that ability to break the line. Um, he, he's probably got more leg speed and more speed overall than James Fisher-Harris as well. Fisher-Harris started as a second rower. People need to remember that. Correct. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think... That's a good idea. We, you and me talked a couple of weeks. I think it was after the podcast how um, Penrith recruit a very, very, very specific sort of player slash athlete normally as their fringe starting second rowers. Uh, and they're normally a, a little taller. They can play. They could play in the set, in uh, the centres if you needed them to but they're more suited to second row. They've got good mobility. They've got a good motor. And like, I, I remember when we talked about it, we joked that I joked with you, like I bet if you put all of their heights and weights in, like in rugby league project, they're probably all within a few kilos and a few centimeters of each other. Like, oh, absolutely. And and I'm thinking like Cape well, Hoskins, um, you know, plays of that. Ilk. Garner. Yeah. Yeah. Garner's another one. They're, they're very specific sort of player and Penrith keep targeting those guys. They're really the only guys that they've brought into the club from outside the club over the last few years. So um, look for players like that maybe, but if I think it'd be, I mean, look, if they got Stefan, it would be a, a bit sickening to everyone else. Um, but I think that that would be a move that the Panthers would see 
if they could get him, it kind of sets them up pretty damn well going forward. Um, and it fills a hole because there's definitely a hole there in the team now. Absolutely. And look, this is the thing. There's there's plenty of genuinely talented youngsters out there. Mm-hmm. And not even youngsters, but people who are in, you know, early approaching mid-20s mm. who would be – they'd just go to the next level if they went to the Panthers. I, look, I'm thinking of someone like Luca Moretti that's at the Eels, mm-hmm. um, plays the game hard and fast. Not a huge frame on him, but he's only got to put on, you know, six, seven kilos of muscle on him, and he's automatically up to the, exactly the same um, size of your Liam Martin, your James Fisher-Harris. Yeah. Um, he does play a lot through the middle of the field as well. You could you could look at someone like that. Um, God, there was someone else I was thinking of too the other day, and I can't remember. I can't remember his name. But you don't have to go for these out-and-out expensive guys. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure the Panthers have got plenty of young talent coming through as well. I mean, we, we had um, that Maverick guy come through and play first grade recently, and he didn't do anything wrong. No, no, he played all right, yeah. I don't know some Panthers fans are saying, you know, why is he getting more time? You're going, this is what you got to do, though. Yeah. You get him a little bit. You make him hungry for it. Mm-hmm. You keep him pushing for it. If you give him the whole season off the bench, you don't want to give him too much too early. Mm-hmm. You need to keep their ego in check, keep them hungry, keep them driving and pushing for it. Um, he'll get plenty more game time this year, and he will be playing very regularly next year. There's no doubt about it. But um, you still need to make up for the forward you've just lost. Yeah. And that's why someone like like a Moretti, you can, that's if you don't get Utica Manu. There's a lot of young players out there also available that they could look at as well. Um, to fill in that 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 vacant role, so you know they could look at say a hard worker like, like Jermaine Hopgood, also at the Eels. If you wanted an absolute workhorse in the middle, yeah, that you could go with that sort of player. Um, so, you know, there's there are options. I think another person that's off contract, uh. Completely unique body size and shape. I'm not sure he's suited to Panthers, but Shaq Mitchell at South. He's an interesting one. He's he's caught my eye playing for South. Yeah, over the. I think I think the thing he has to do, is, he'd be really good at Penrith in that they get him physically a little bit better, um, a bit more up to speed. I think that physically, he still looks a little bit too much like a New South Wales Cup player. Um, but, yeah, he, I mean, he'd be a good depth guy. Yeah. What are, I the, mean, chan- what are the chan... Okay, let's let's have some fun. Right? Yeah. Let's have some fun. Payne Haas is not moving. We know that, right? Mm-hmm. It's not Payne Haas. What about Jason Tamalolo? He's the wrong guy. I just want Jason Tamalolo on my team. Yeah, I don't think Ivan Cleary does. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. Because the what only about, way Ivan Cleary would use him is off the bench, and I don't think Tamalolo would move somewhere just to be a bench forward. No. Um, Fuck it, it'd, decent, it'd be devastating in the middle, though. Oh, it'd be crazy. It'd be a little bit crazy. Him, him linking up with, um, <laughs> with, with Yo and Cleary. Or, <laughs> oh fuck me! And you got if, Edward, if, Edwards hanging around behind him. If they could get, if they could get his knee sorted, take take a bit of weight off him, like we said in, in the last episode. It's not even like. Like, there's not weight to lose. He's just a giant dude. But if they could somehow strip some weight off of him just to take pressure off his knees, and, yeah, that would be that would be pretty sick. Um, Sipley at the, at the Northern Eagles. Uh, well, yeah, the Northern Eagles, Sipley. He'd be a pretty handy player. I think that at the moment he's more of a, a bench player an impact mate, player, but mate, it, mate, I've just thought of the perfect one for you that you would I, absolutely I, love. I know who you're going to say. You say it, so no, I can no. swear at you. 
I'm no, no. I, I'm being legit honest here. Okay. Twenty-four years old. Okay. Tino. Big Tino. Big Tino. He's signed a ten-year deal. Fucking mate, that means shit all. Buy it out. <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> how about or how about Fotoaka? Pay out a twelve million dollar contract. Um, Fotoaka's not on a ten-year deal. You know what? Fotoaka might be a pretty, pretty. They might be able to get something out of Fotoaka. That's a good one. Uh, who else have we got? Trying to find guys that aren't too old. Yeah, uh, that's the thing. And already we're looking at blokes who are getting up around 28 years old. Yeah. See, that's the thing. If they, if they, and it's a bit, it's like swinging for the fences on what they've built. That's why yeah. if they get the right dude, they're setting themselves up for a, a, an extended run that they may be, it, it just, it, it, it it pushes the timeline out a little bit because James Fisher Harris, I think is like 29, 30, which is fine. Like that's, he's in literally, he's at the prime of his career. Yeah. Uh, and he's got many years left in him too. But you get a guy that's say 25 and he's a, is at the top of his game. It just pushes the timeline out a bit, you know? Oh, absolutely. Um, but there's not many of them. There's not tell you many what, of guys. There's a guy who is off contract at the end of the year, mm-hmm. a year younger than Fisher Harris. Mm-hmm. Josh Papali. Well, it's funny you say because that was somebody that uh, Nadine texted me and said about him, and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I think he's going to stay in Canberra. That would be crazy. That would be a that would be pretty rude getting him. He feels like he's got more footy. It, he feels like he's in footy years. He's about thirty-two, though. That's only one year older than what he actually is. He's thirty-one, well, yeah, but, and he turns, that, he turns thirty-two in a month's time. Oh, well, there you go. I can really nail these players' ages. It's crazy. <laughs> you said he was you one year younger yeah, than James. Is. Um, he's coming up to three hundredth game. He'll play his three hundredth game in. 11 games away. It'd be a good two-year contract. That's all you need, man. Yeah, yeah. And he, and that's the thing. He has stayed remarkably healthy for the majority of his career. Yeah, he has. He like has. Last year was the first time he played less than 20 games in a season since 2014. And in 2014, he played 19 games. And you the know, year before that, 21. The year before that, 26. And 2011, 14. And, and like... Ridiculous. There's no, there's no shirk in what he does. Like he, no, he, he is, he is playing. He's the lead forward in that Canberra team, and no one, like, there's no reason to ever, you know, talk about his lack of quality as a player. He just is fantastic. It's he's not the problem in Canberra. Oh God, uh, no, 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 no. He, he's a genuine leader, and abs. He is a genuine workhorse. Hmm. Um, and probably close to. The, the most similar replacement for James Fisher Harris as far as experience, age, quality, ability, all that sort of stuff. Reliability. Yeah. Which is I mean, this is this is the stuff that you want. Yeah, yeah. The one thing that is a problem against Papali that you didn't have with Fisher Harris is state of origin. Yep. Fisher Harris would play through that period, whereas Papali will always get picked for Queensland. It's a huge if, and like we're not basing this on anything. We're just people on here. Fair, we're doing fantasy football at this stage. We are. We are. We're Phil Goulding it. They call it. <laughs> we're um, gussing it. Yeah, we're gussing it. <laughs> because Penrith don't have Penrith to get players from, we're having to look elsewhere. Um, I wonder if you you went to him and said, look. We'll give you a two-year deal. We know it's short, all right? It's going to be for an all right amount of money. Like, we'll just literally give you what we were given James Fisher-Harris. And yeah. that's enough that all but two or three props in the whole game are going to say, oh, geez, that's great. And look, to be honest, it'll probably be very close to what he's currently getting at the Raiders. Probably, yeah, because he's, I mean, his last contract, he would have been one of the leading props in the game when he got that. Mm-hmm. 
you say to him, it's a chance to maybe win a premiership, but we want you to retire from origin. I wonder how that package would suit. Ooh, you'd have to pay more, not less. Yeah. Well, it's 50, what is that, 40, 40 grand for an yeah. origin game? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So he's, he's going he's gonna to miss out on six of those over two years. That's good. So you're going to need to put a quarter of a million on top of it. You know, the the thing that is kind of crazy and awesome and, like, thank God they're like this is Penrith, they normally make the right decision on players. You know, it, even their worst – like, if you think what's probably a signing for them that hasn't worked out as well as you thought, it's probably Garner, and Garner's been a – kind of a, a solid first grader for him. Like, that's the low end of the scale. But most of the players they sign, who, when you sign them, you don't, when they sign them, you don't even think of them. Like, you're like, Jack Cogger? Like, what? They normally turn out to be fantastic signings that work out great. So it's cool to know that they're, they're a team with a little bit of money that's available with a good junior base, but they also make good decisions too. So as a Panthers fan myself, that's something that I sort of think of and think, man, thank God that we're not going to see them make a a silly mistake or a silly decision. And so if they sign some dude that, you know, is some reserve grader on another team, you know, you might hear me come on here and go, oh, really? (laughs) But if this time next year he's absolutely killing it, it wouldn't be a shock. So we'll see what happens, eh? Absolutely. Now, there's two players, and I don't think any of these can be taken seriously. But one I heard someone on online asking whether the Tigers should chase him. And I just said no, because that's all it needed. And that was Schuster. Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> And the other one is one that we saw being mentioned to us, which was Jack DeBellin. Yeah, and that's another extreme no. If you if you were down and they were the only two players you had left available, who are you picking and why is it not Jack DeBellin? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll tell it, you what, though. Yeah. Do, do you want me to go through the list of props that are currently on the market at the end of the year? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, I will warn you, it's not great reading. No, I I, I knew that. I knew that. There, there's some decent ones in there, but it's not all. There's some spuds. <laughs> so, <laughs> Matt Croker, Siani Finu, Peter Hola, Valingi Kepu, Liam Knight, Matt Lodge, oh boy, Makahisi Makatoa, Jordan McLean, Thomas McKayley, Shaq Mitchell, Tapai Moroa, Jura Momoisa, Offa Hickey Ogden, Chris Patolo, Aaron Penne, Jermaine Tanua Brown, Martin Tapao, Zane Tetavano, Jared Wallace, Aaron Woods. Is that it? That's it. So, um, you getting Woodsy? No. No? Mate, he's a test no. player. I know. <laughs> so is Aaron no. Raper. No, no. The, the, the correct response to that was how. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could, if you could get to that. So, like, say, uh, Wallace, right? Because he, he's he's coming off season end in injury, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he so he sits out this year. I wonder if you could get Wallace and uh, Liam Knight. It's possible. I mean, you you would with the with the money you're throwing around. Yeah. Get like get both, but I wonder if you could get both of them. Yeah, I can't see why not. I reckon you'd go close at the very least. So the other option was you could use a lock four because it's still in the middle of the field. Yeah. Um, and the ones that are off contract there are Nathan Brown, Jack DeBellin, Matt Eisenhuth, Isaac Liu, Damon Marshall, Trey Mooney, Tyrone Peachy, Ray Stone, Tavita Tormopinu, and Jazz Tavanga. Jazz Tavung is not a bad player. I like him. He's not too bad. Yeah. Um, and your th- essentially your third option is to move Martin to the to the front row 
mm-hmm. and then you've got to look for a second row. And the ones that are currently off contract there, um, Billy Burns, Michael Cheekham, Angus Crichton, Tom Eisenhuth, uh, Finney Fulkai, Luke Garner, Cleese Haas, Cohen Hess, Brody Jones, Carl Lawton, Ben Lovett, Ben Murdoch Masilla, Joe Stimson, Jaden Sewer, Jackson Tapine, Corey Waddell, Jack Williams, Elliot Whitehead. Hmm. Uh, probably not. <laughs> probably well, not. Finnefuakai has been playing pretty good, so he probably wouldn't be too bad a pick up there. But he'd basically just be a straight swap for um is it Ghana that you'd be you'd be losing? Because I think that's what would happen there. Yeah, yeah, it feels um like that'd be a, a an probably an upgrade in that area there. There's not a huge amount to pick from here at this stage. Is I think I think the thing that we can take out of all of this, right? The Viliami Kikau is homesick. He wants to go back to Penrith. Can we just get Viliami Kikau back? Can we do that? Look, I, I had an idea. Okay. And I'd, I'd like to talk to you uh-huh. as the West Tigers representative, to you, the Penrith Panthers representative, all right? Okay, okay. I Let, I, me, just, let me just take a sip from my golden goblet. Please, Continue. please. Continue. And I'll... I'll just piss on the floor here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I'm sure there's some water in the dog's bowl you can uh, take, but c- please continue, continue. <laughs> <laughs> right. So because I'm a, I'm a historian, I like watching history taking place. Yeah. And the Panthers are on this massive run. How's about, I say to you, you can have, you can have Yutika Manu, but you also have to take Bateman. Make that deal. How much Bateman wouldn't be on a huge amount, would he? So long as you're covering the salary for both of them, we're happy. We're not asking for any players back in return. We just want both of them off our if, books. If Utkimanu, right? If he's if the the West Tigers go to him and say, "We know you've been approached, right? Be honest with us." Like, we know you're under contract with us, and we know that there's a possibility your clause will kick in. If that clause kicks in, will you be going to the Panthers? If he says yes, and you're the West Tigers, do you would you be able to say, listen, we will clear the runway for you right now to go and join them next year. Um, but the deal is we want them to take Bateman off our books 100%. If I'm the Panthers, if I'm, I tell you what, here's how I do it if I'm the Panthers. If I'm the Panthers, I do it. And what I do is I go to Bateman and I say, how, like, how long's Bateman get, got left on his contract? Two, three years. Okay, so say it's two years after this year. Let's say that. So I'll, I'll find it for you so we can be okay, sure. Okay. Because um, what I would, I would say He's he's not going to get another contract in the NRL after this. Uh, he's signed until twenty twenty six. Okay, twenty. So two years after this. Yep. Yep. Um, we'll extend Bateman's contract for three years. But so twenty twenty seven. Yeah, but yep. so he won't lose a dollar, but his amount on the cap will be lower. I think he'd take that deal. Yeah, he probably would. And then what do you do with him once you got him? Send him to the Bulldogs. <laughs> yeah, we, start, we just <laughs> get kicked on back. <laughs> we wait for Phil Gould to turn up with a you know in a hoodie outside of Panthers like he does for every other signing. <laughs> no, because oh. I think that I think you would get to a point where you. Where Bateman's, I mean, Bateman's going to go back to England. We all know that. Yeah. I think eventually he'd just go back to England. You see, I think that's what the Tigers should be looking at here. Sure, we lose our key prop forward. Yeah. But if in the process of doing that, we free up a million dollars in the cap, because that's probably what that would end up being with him and Bateman gone. Mm-hmm. 
go buy a prop. Anyone you want. Yeah, yeah, you could get you'd get everyone except Payne Haas. And I yeah. only say that because Haas has a million plus contract and he's it's long term and he's locked in. Just yeah. he's only just locked it in. So, but yeah, anyone else you get them basically. Yeah. So I I see that as a a move in the right direction. And so we we'd be helping each other out. And if in turn it ends up with Bateman going to the Bulldogs <laughs> or Parramatta. <laughs> Happy days. Happy yeah. days. He'd be suited to Parramatta. <laughs> so shall we shall we go into another topic which I've seen just come up? And this is another sort of fantasy thing that like we've just done. Okay, well we haven't really talked about like James Fisher Harris at the Warriors yet. Well, no, but, I mean, let's be honest. Well, we'll go there, okay. This is going to make their pack insanely good. Yes. They're going to be incredible. Oh. It's just ridiculously incredible. Losing Adam Fanua Blake, no one knew how they were going to replace that. Mm -hmm. And they've just gone, this is how we're going to do it. Um, It's it's a brilliant move. It was silent. No one leaked anything from any side. The, his manager, the Panthers, the Warriors, that tells you like high quality people all round. And he brings in all that premiership winning success, which I think they probably really could use. Um, he gives them another leader. Just perfect. A real perfect signing for them. That's a That's a huge one. Like, it, this is one of those moves that's, like, and we've already done it just now. Like, you could see a bunch of dominoes fall because of this move. It's such a good move. Oh, it's ridiculous. And I'm just having a look now at the Warriors' gains and losses for the next, you know, for this year and for next year. Mm-hmm. And what you can, what you hear out of this is unbelievably good management of their roster. So the, for this year, they lost Viliami Vailia, Bailey Siren, and Braden Viliami, Josh Curran, Ronald Volkman. And they picked up Roger Tuovasasek, Chanel Harris Tavita, Kurt Capewell. They've lost Adam Fanil Blake for next year and picked up James Fisher Harris. That's incredible. That's an insane amount of upgrade. Going to a, all of those players going to a finals team. Like normally you would not yeah. see that if it was a we've bottomed out and we've got three million bucks to spend sort of team. <laughs> it's it's insane. Mm. That's how you do it. Mm. So it's it's brilliant what they've done there. Their their forward pack is going to be ridiculous and the person who benefits most out of that is Sean Johnson. Yes. That's it. That was my first thought. Um man, playing behind that forward pack, it's going to be hard to not be good. Imagine was it two, three years ago? He was like centimeters close to retirement. He was going that just traveling that poorly after he had that um, horrible tendon injury. He's like he's done. He was just done, yeah. And he's just gone. Not yet, fellas. I've never seen anything like it. Hey, it's been phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. It's all, and um, it's awesome when you watch like these Warriors games. First of all, when you watch them in New Zealand, and the, it's like every game's been sold out so far. And the thing I love watching about them is that they haven't got a fade in them. Like they're a solid footy team. They're better than they were last year by quite some way, where last year it felt like you could just outlast them just a little bit longer or they would – they just didn't have the the absolute confidence that the top sides have in themselves – This year, I think they really do. Like, my estimation of them is going up every week. Win, lose, and draw with them, too. Like, even in their losses, they're not looking too bad at all. No, this is no flash in the pan thing. That that finals appearance last year was not not just something they do every now and then like they always used to. It's the start of something big. And that, I think it probably worried both of us that it was going to be a flash in the pan. Yeah. It's 100% not. They need to be a regular competitor in the finals. Yeah. Um, and they're making all the right moves at the moment. It's it's great to watch because it, it's it's what rugby league needs here and in New Zealand. So it's it's definitely brilliant what they're doing. Well, the finals are always better when New Zealand's in it. They, it just is. You know, it 
it's weird the difference that it makes to the finals. It it almost makes it like a, it's like a, a carnival sort of atmosphere, a little bit of a touch of when the World Cup is at its best sort of thing. Yeah. In, in that you know that like all of New Zealand is really paying attention to it. Um, it's very cool. And I guess what this probably does is, and it's not a problem right now, but it probably makes the Warriors start thinking, if Johnson calls time on his career, say at the end of this year or next year, they need to be ready for that. Yeah. Whereas I think that before a move like this, it would have just been something that they'd have to deal with. Now it's like, well, we've got to make sure we keep a really good team going in the right direction. If that does happen, yeah. um, it just changes their expectations. It's absolutely gigantic. It's like, it's probably close to Glenn Lazarus changing teams. And um, he won premierships at three different clubs. Mm. No, it, it really is. Uh, look, and the good thing is having a great... ...with anything else makes it so much easier for you to land whatever halfback you want as well. Yeah. So that's the first thing a halfback's looking at. Who's, yeah. who's landing the platform for me? Uh, so that, that's a big thing. Um, Parramatta question going around is where will Lomax play when he arrives and I saw someone it might have been um, the Twitter account the Cumberland Throw if you don't follow Mm -hmm. them please do it's all Parramatta stuff but um, good content but they put out a poll today I think it was and it said um, where will Lomax play will he be a winger a centre or will he be fullback oh it's interesting they asked that yeah so uh, where would you put him on, uh, in that Parramatta back line? Because some people are suggesting mm-hmm. that maybe he should go to fullback and Gutherson to centre. And I went, ooh. No, ooh, I wouldn't play that's, Gutherson to centre. That, that feels like two wrongs make a really, really big wrong. <laughs> yeah. At the, the old outside back in me just started tingling, going, give me the ball. I need the ball. <laughs> this guy's in the centers. Um <laughs> You'd be you'd be just looking at Gutherson and going, I've got him. I've got him. Yeah, you but, really would. You really would. Um, look, you'd, you'd get an improvement at fullback uh, from the kick return side of game with Lomax there. Not difficult. Not difficult. The playmaking, you and me, you and the me playmaking part of it. kicks better. Oh yeah, <laughs> comfortably. <laughs> um, but the the playmaking ability that Lomax has is nowhere near what Gutherson has. So you lose out there when you're in there in the red zone. Um, Gutherson at centre, that's a nightmare defensively. Yeah, for Parramatta. So I don't think that's an option. There's a reason why he's at fullback, and that's to hide his defence. Uh, his his defense is easier to hide at five eight. So I, I don't know why people suggest moving him to centre. That's just, just a horrible idea to me. So I think Lomax will probably go to the wing. But I mean, they can go anywhere in that back line. They, they, it's not like they've got a a three quarter line that's brimming with absolute certainties. Yeah, I, I'd probably look. I would probably. I'd just play him in the on the wing personally. Um, he's he's got to be on the right side though; can't be on the left. He's a right side player. Yeah. Um, and the Dragons have been fucking around, moving him on the left and the right, and they've been parking him on the left now. And nah, he's got to be on the right side. Whether it's wing or centre doesn't matter, but that's where he's got to be. So yeah. But yeah, well, I just thought it was interesting that they threw up fullback because it just meant that you'd have to move Gutherson somewhere, and where you move him to. And, uh, yeah, there's a reason why he's there. They're hiding him as much as they can defensively. And he does have he does have enough playmaking ability to be useful at this level, but he doesn't have enough fullback ability to be a legit fullback on his own. I just think Parramatta should re-sign him to an even longer deal. Oh, they will. <laughs> <laughs> He will sign the first 15-year deal Yeah, <laughs> at the age of 32. Yeah. Just keep him on. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I'd, just put, I'd put Lomax on the – I wouldn't have bought Lomax in the first place, though. 
he 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 just I don't rate him. I don't rate him at all. Thing, they, they they need three quarter players, but why would you buy a guy who you don't know what his position is in the three quarter line? Like that doesn't you, you want blokes where you just go, okay, he's going to be in that spot. Yeah, and we know what jumper he's wearing. But they've bought a guy and they're going, yeah, we'll figure it out next week. Yeah, it's just I just feel like it's not what they need at it's all. A, it's a very West Tigers signing that they've yeah. done. It just really is. Like he was available, and that was it. Yeah. So at that rate, it must mean that they must be pretty close to Landon Schuster soon. <laughs> the only place I would say for Schuster is, um, yeah, I can only I say it all the time, Melbourne. Send him to Melbourne. See what Craig Bellamy can do with him, because Craig Bellamy does a lot with a little. And if anybody can sort him out, it's him. But I don't know what he would do with him. I I just don't like. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, he, he's in that realm of players like Jack Bird. Um, yeah, Curtis Sura, I guess that sort of thing. You just look at him and go, you've got weirdly unique skills, but you don't stand out as an NRL quality player in one specific position. So it makes it hard for a club to go, yep. You're exactly what we need because nobody needs a bloke who doesn't know what position he's playing. That's why Tyrone Peachy bounced around from clubs, and most of the time he was playing on the bench. But, and Tyrone yeah. Peachy is a much more skillful version of John Schuster, of Josh Schuster. There's no oh, doubt about it. Way but more, way more. He, you, you can't get away with being just a utility player these days. You could do that in the early 2000s. Those players were absolute an absolute goldmine to have in your team because you just put them on the bench and they can just go and play wherever you want. But the game is now played in such such intense structure how it plays that these diverse players like this who have got this unique skill set but no actual, you know, ability to lock down one position, they're more of a hindrance than a, um, you know, an improvement to your roster because you can't, form any sort of game plan or structure around this person that's just a square peg trying to fit in a round hole, you know? Mm -hmm. And all coaches are trying to do this really structured stuff everywhere. You can't have these players that are too much outside the box and not a set structured human. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's what's happened to the game. That's why people like that tend to just end up in England because they still have a little bit of that flexibility like that because... And that's what it comes down to. Like the the short answer for what is this player is that they're a reserve grader and they they look pretty good in reserve grade too. Um, And it's mainly around their size and they're, they're, they've got, they're like jack of all trades master and none and it works well at that level, but you get to the NRL and it, it just... It doesn't translate. No. Uh, that's the thing. He's he's a decent sized player. He's like 106 kilos. Mm. Six foot two, six foot one, six foot two. Yeah, he's a big dude. Problem is, yeah. he's the mobility isn't the mobility doesn't stand out. The line breaking doesn't stand out. And, and it's yeah, he's just a he's a reserve grade quality player, which is better than most players on planet Earth. But it's just you, there's not really a place for those players in the NRL outside of the Titans. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Um, what else has been going on? Is there anything else we need to get through? Well, we've got the that um the list of of uh things that come out about the oh, yes. league in New yep. Zealand. Um, it was posted by, let me find it. It was posted by somebody. It was from the NRL. Yep. Um, and so, hang on, I'm just getting it up on my my phone. So it says op- over the opening four, the, I believe this is from the National Rugby League. Yep. Um, over the opening four rounds this year, New Zealand television viewership of all matches is up 32% on last year's full season average and 47% on last year's year-to-date average. That's ridiculous. So that's, yeah, that's crazy. That's a crazy leap. 
New Zealand television viewership for matches involving the Warriors is up 45% on last year's full season average and up 74% on the year to date average, which is insane. These are, um, <laughs> these are overseas dictator you know, election result numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's nuts, 74%. Yeah, it's crazy. Attendances in New Zealand over the first five rounds are up 59% on the entire 2019 <laughs> season. As I said, they've all, I think they've every single game's been the sellout so far. Yeah, it has. And they haven't got an undersized stadium either. They've got a proper-sized stadium. Yeah, 20-odd thousand. Yep. Yeah. All this is the Warriors celebrate six successive home sellouts this year. Four in Auckland and two in Christchurch in the pre-season Challenge Cup in the NRL competition. Yep. Um, George, who I believe is the – he might be the owner of the – Yeah, he is. A, I forgot his first name. Yeah. Said marketing crowds, membership and merchandise were being blown out of the water and that the gap between league and union was closing. Absolutely without – he said this, a quote, absolutely without a shadow of the doubt, I strongly believe we have taken – over the sporting ticket in New Zealand in terms of elite, competi- elite competition teams in comparison to Super Rugby. Now, I, like, if they want to expand the comp, I think you just, you, you say, we're going to have another team in New Zealand. You do that for, look, I reckon you could do it for next year and it'd work out, hey. But that's very quick. Um, they need to expand. They need to expand into New Zealand, and we need to take a entire round of game to New Zealand. Where yeah, everyone, look, we, as, you, as we said before, like we should be having a magic weekend there. Yeah, across all of New Zealand, though. Yeah, absolutely. Just take over, and like as much as rugby league fans in New Zealand would love to see that, the rugby union people in New Zealand, and I mean just the administrators, would be horrified by something like that happening, um, it's the last thing they want to see. No, I fully agree, man. It's the, and I mean, you, you said it perfectly there. Like the best thing we could be doing is having a magic weekend there where instead of having just all the games at one venue, we have like a bunch of double headers. Yeah. So double header at Auckland, Hamilton, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin, you know, cover the whole bloody country mm-hmm. and just have them all over the place. Um, that would be the, the absolute best thing to do. Uh, and, you know, it, if you've got, like, any games left over, have a game on a Thursday, have a game on a Monday mm. and just have that thing go for as long as possible, that whole period, and that way you just allow as many people to get to as many games as possible and see as much of the footy as possible. Yeah. But that is exactly what you do. And that's how you, you know, you do that for two straight years just to make sure that the numbers aren't just good, but they, they're growing because that's what will happen. And if that's happening, just go, right, we're putting a team in Christchurch or Wellington or something like that. I'd, I'd, I'd be more inclined to go to Christchurch, have a South team and a North team. I've I've always leaned towards Christchurch, especially if they – build a new stadium like they said they've been going to. There's talk that they were going to build an indoor stadium, which uh, just would be fantastic. But, yeah, if you get a new stadium, cause, because I think that the venue needs to be a big part of it. That's the thing that gets me about Wellington is, you know, you got that st- stadium in Wellington, but it's an oval. I think you need rugby league to be played full-time at rectangular st- stadiums because it's just a much better viewing experience. Um and, yeah, like, you know, you take the Magic Weekend over there, spread it out everywhere, have it so that you can sign up for your local rugby league teams or sign up for um, overseas NRL club memberships at every single game and easily, like, just make it make it your taking over. Like, call it the New Zealand takeover. Like, be bold about it. Yeah. It would be fantastic for the game. What would the new Christchurch team be named? I don't know. I, I like to leave that up to New Zealand. Um, I wrote an article. Did you see the article I wrote about the Bears? 
No, I've, I have oh. been reading you some of your articles recently, but I, I didn't see the one about the bears. I wrote. I wrote an article because there was a thing. Uh, one of the stupid idiots in the Telegraph said that the that we should have another team in New Zealand, and that should they should call themselves the Bears and be black and red, and you know all this same stupid shit. So I wrote an article saying what we should do, right, is have a brand new expansion club in Perth, but we're going to name them after the mascot and give them the same colours as a dead club from the 1990s from Auckland, right? And it's going to seem weird and there's no connection at all, but we're going to do it anyway. And they're going to have to play one or two games a year at the old ground of that dead club in Auckland for no real reason whatsoever. Now, that ground isn't up to modern standards at all. That's why that club, yeah, that's why that club died. But nostalgia. Nostalgia. Well, right? as Steve Roach told us. Yeah. And I think that that's – and then at the end of it, I basically wrote, no, nah, that, actually, that's a fucking stupid idea. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, look. This is the thing, okay. Obviously, I'm a historian, okay, so I, I do like traditional things. But at the same time, you've got to know when to draw the line – between honouring the past and recognising that some things in the past were not perfect. And they're, they're, they're in the past for a reason. That's right, because they weren't perfect. And we've, we've improved, we've got better, we've made things better, we've become a much smarter business, which makes a lot more money. I don't... I Look, I'll tell you what. I appreciate... And I am absolutely um, astounded by how persistent and how um, well organised the push for the Bears is. It's just a shame that they didn't exist when the Bears did. Yeah. Right? But you move on. Yes. Just, 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 it's it's up there, this whole push for the Bears. It's up there with this article that comes out and this complaint that comes out from the media every year, and I'm going off contract, off, off topic now. They do this every year where they go, oh, it's not a good look when you get to see players who have just lost on the field shaking hands and chatting with the blokes that just beaten them. Yeah. The fuck? Can we just, can we just move into, like, 2024 <laughs> I'm the one who's supposed to have antiquated bloody ideas and concepts and I'm in 2024 what the fuck is you lot doing boning about wanting to have a team that won nothing for 70 years you want them brought back why if they were any good and if they were so passionately supported at the time and if they were so well run at the time why do they not still exist exactly they're in the part of Sydney, which had the least amount of competition. They had one team to compete against them, Manly, and they're not even close. And they couldn't win that competition. They couldn't even draw people to their venue with a tree on it. They had to go and get another one built. And that they got destroyed by fucking rain. Yep. I mean, that, ven- that venue now is a quarter over a quarter of a century old. Like... That's yeah. how long ago this team is from. If you were a teenager that supported the North Sydney Bears, you're in your forties now. That's like, who's this club for? <laughs> I know it's just, and I say this with all due respect to the North fans of the past who went and they supported their club just like everybody else did. I'm sad your team's gone, but you know what? So is mine. And how many times have you heard me on here going, "Bring back Balmain"? No, you know why? Because they're gone. And what I've got left is the West Tigers, and that's who I that's who I go with. Okay, you got to roll with the times. That's just what you got to do. It's it's insane. I just mm. they're the only club that does it. And yeah, it's a, it's a strange one. Like even even Newtown isn't stupid. Newtown like, and even Glebe, mm. right? They found their niche. They're mm. happy to exist. They don't need to exist in the elite level. They're happy to exist where they are. They're relevant. They can still be seen on TV. They're still appealing to their very, very 
passionate core group of fans, they also know that it's a massive fucking step from New South Wales Cup to the NRL. Massive step. And that's a step that is too far for most, for nearly every team that's in the New South Wales Cup because, let's be honest, none of them have made the step up. Yeah. But also, none of them want to. They like where they are because it is a sense of the old-fashioned thing. You get to go along and just watch your game and play at the footy and you can stand on the hill and watch your team there. And it's got a, it's got that sentimentality about it. If that's what you like, go watch the New South Wales Cup because that will serve all of those needs for you absolutely perfectly. There's nothing wrong with that. And they do it great at that level. Stop what... trying to bring, though, mm. this 1970s, 1980s feel into the current game where it doesn't belong. Because it's not a move forward for the game. Playing games at Belmore and Redfern Oval and Leichhardt Oval and Cogger Oval, all these other bloody tiny parks that are out in the middle of the, just no parking around them. They're complicated to get to. They don't have huge seating. Yeah, yeah, it's great memories and great nostalgia. But you know what? It's not a modern venue. It's not a modern ground. It's just, it's not where we are now. We can't improve the game by trying to drag it back to where it was in the past. Because everything we've done to improve it so far has been dragging it forward, not dragging it backwards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I don't know how you can watch a game, you know, being played at Suncorp Stadium where on a bad day they get 35,000 people seated in comfort or watching a game in North Queensland where they've got that new stadium up there where, you know, everyone's seated in comfort. Or the new stadium at, at, at the Sydney Football Stadium that looks fantastic. I don't know how you can watch games played in those venues and say, no, we need not as much of that as we need people getting there, you know, sitting on a, a wet, soggy hill with the, you know, sitting on the grass. And it makes no sense to me whatsoever because, yeah. like, you know, it just is so dumb. It's so dumb. The game moves forward for a reason, and you know, North Sydney, rest in peace. But uh, it's over. It was over twenty five fucking years ago. Yeah, it's not changing. Whole heap of clubs died back then, including They've my been, one. But I'm not sitting there boning and groaning about it like others are. You just got to accept it and move on, man, because that's where the game is now. They've been dead for longer than Illawa- the Illawarra Steelers were around. Hmm. This is right. Then they've been dead for longer than when the Glebe team were around for. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's nuts. I don't get it. Um, a few other things before we get into this week's preview. Mm-hmm. You, the not you, because I mean we don't know the password to the uh, the Fergo Freak Pod Twitter account. Twitter account. Yeah, did you see they put up a these bastards. They put up a, a question. Yeah. Which team do you want to see win between the Tigers and the Panthers for the good of the podcast? Have, um, have we got have we got results? There's been 28 votes. Okay. Not many and votes. Uh, hmm? Not too many no. votes. No, no. That's uh I can say 57 57.1% have gone for the West Tigers. Fucking pieces of shit. <laughs> I don't understand why it wouldn't be for the best for the Panthers to win. Like, can Penrith just catch one break, please? I, I, I put Nothing out a, goes our way. Nothing. I put, I put out a stat okay. the other day. Yes. Um, <laughs> some, someone tried to explain the joke that because it was a bit too subtle. So I said, the West Tigers have won eight of their last 11 games against the Penrith side without Nathan Cleary. Okay, now, th- does that include before he was even the player? Yes, of course yeah. the fuck it does. <laughs> <Not so. laughs> Technically, I'm right. Yeah, you, you're not wrong. <laughs> um, but, yeah, someone said, oh, you got to go to 2012 for all that. I said, I replied to him going, you're not supposed to explain the joke, mate. <laughs> I get that all the time on Twitter, hey, where it's like, I just want to say, yes, that is the joke. Thank yeah. you. I told it. Yes. That's a good one. Um, I don't know if I mentioned before, but the the England v. France international is coming up, and they've also organised the RFL for 
Toulouse to play on as the warmer as the as another match that's being played on exactly the same day at the same ground. So any French players who are going to come from the Toulouse side are now going to be lining up for Toulouse and not France. Um, yeah, and that, the international is the warm up to the, that first division club game. Which, that's right. So it's I mean, um, I, it's crazy because wasn't there all these talks from England that they're sick of constantly beating France all the time? Yeah, they so say that they they you know they the rugby football league are constantly saying that Australia needs to take rug, international rugby league more seriously. And then in an effort to cut costs, they go to Toulouse and they say, hey, can we just fucking get in as a warm-up match to this game you're playing? Now, Toulouse is obviously thinking to themselves, we might make it a little bit on gate-taking. So they say, yes, it does undermine the French rugby league team, the national team, but I see where Toulouse is coming from. But... How fucking pathetic are the Rugby Football League that they think that this is of the standard that you should be able to treat the national team? Yes. So I've I've got an idea for a coup. Okay. We to get as many of the players from the current Kangaroo side, get them all to grow those very very French moustaches. They've got a they've got a month and a half to get going, mm-hmm. and they go over there wearing a beret. I know I'm being very stereotypical right now. But we've got to have a disguise. And they go over there and they all have very French names and they turn up where playing for France and they absolutely belt the poms. And then before anyone can say anything, they all just get on a plane and they head back, have a shave on the plane, get back, and then they're in Australia before anyone knows. You basically just described the last Rugby League World Cup, hey? <laughs> <laughs> when we had... <laughs> fucking Luke Keery going around there going, hey, to be sure, to be sure, I'm Irish. <laughs> fucking ridiculous. I could teach the Australian players how to speak French. Yeah. Bird. You just like someone's, do you know how to say uh, thank you? <laughs> how do you say please? <laughs> <laughs> that could work. Just, just, Sit them down on the whole flight. They can just watch Pepe Le Pew. Yeah. Pick up the, pick up the accent. Pick up the language. But, uh, yeah, that, that's my idea. Go over there. Absolutely belt the palms. Just say, oh, look, we had to use a bunch of reserve graders. Because, <laughs> you know, that, there was, we couldn't use anyone. You know, we had Catalan team were not available. We couldn't use anyone from Toulouse. You know, we just had to use these reserve graders. Imagine the Australian Rugby League saying we're playing New Zealand and we're, we're going to be a warm-up game for like fucking Wentworthville versus North Sydney, right? <laughs> and But everyone else needs to, you know, take International Rugby League more seriously. It's just another sign that the Rugby League in the UK is fucking dying, man. Well, I was going to put it to you. Do you think this intentional move to basically deny to lose players from lining up for France and thus making France weaker. Is that the most clearest sign yet that England fears France? I, I think it's, I think it's more a case of just being incompetent, not caring, to be honest. Like I can say it definitely helps England, but I just think they don't really care about, I, don't, I think they don't really care about rugby league in general, to be honest with you. Like so I'm not happens? talking about the, I'm not talking about the fans or the players. I mean the rugby league administrators in England. I just don't think they give a fuck. Like, are you and me supposed to really give a fuck about that fixture when they don't give a fuck? Well, this is right. How like big would it be? Fuck, I don't give a fuck. Who gives a fuck? How big would it be if France won that game? Oh, they probably have some excuse. I don't have an excuse, but we can yeah. all we can all choose to ignore that excuse and and mock the living hell out of the extra league. Yeah, because they just, get they get sad about that. I just don't. If they don't care, I don't care. That's what it comes down to. Tell you like, what, I'm I'm going to speak now. <laughs> speak now to the French rugby league and say, if you can come out and beat England, we don't care how you do it. We will organise for the Australian Rugby League team to come over and do solely a tour of France. Oh, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> and now, even better, do a tour of France, and then they go over to England, but only for sightseeing. 
go around and check out Big Ben. They go out and they'll, uh, you know, go and check out Hadrian's Wall. And then they'll just go to the airport and leave. <laughs> Well, you know, England's a really good place for sightseeing because you go into the middle of London, you do a 360 and you've seen all the interesting shit. <laughs> then you leave. Oh, you go to the museums and check out all the stuff they stole. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon that'd be good. That's the absolute ultimate troll. We, that's, mm. that's exactly what Australian rugby league should be doing. Yeah. Uh, Vlandis, get on, the, get on the blower to the French, yeah, and tell them that. I Why doesn't... Why isn't the International Rugby League vetoing this? I, I take it that's a rhetorical question. Yes, it is. Yeah, right. okay, yeah. Um, they, I'm going to drive up to Bell's Line of Road and ask them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to buy a shed while you're there. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I'll buy two fucking sheds. <laughs> I, no, I'm buying a shed and a, and a fucking a chook house. That's right. That's what you got to do. Yeah, I don't have any chickens, but you know, you you got to pay the toll. <laughs> That's right, you do. All right, should we get into this week's games? Yeah, let's do it, Andrew. All right, I've got a few stats here for each of them. Uh, first up, Roosters versus Storm. The last time the Roosters won a regular season game against the Storm in Sydney was round twelve, twenty fifteen. Wow, that's interesting. And Melbourne have won just eleven of their last twenty six games outside Victoria. I've got a, another couple of stats here. Um, these are the only two clubs in the National Rugby League that don't have juniors, <laughs> and they're both clubs that are franchises that were made in 1998. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Very good. Long history. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I'll go as a storm on this one. I am going uh, for the Storm as well. I think the Storm have been pretty clunky so far, and they don't do that for very long. Yeah, I see I see them coming out and just going, you know what, it's time we pull our fucking finger out, people. Let's rip in and see what we can do. And they like to do that against teams that are, you know, reg- are regarded as being a top eight side. I'm not saying mm-hmm. that the Roosters are, but they, they are regarded by, you know, all their sick fans in the media as being a top eight side. So, you know, they mm-hmm. like to put them to them. I think the Storm will fuck them up. Uh, that's what I'm expecting. Yeah. Uh, Dragons Warriors. Dragons have won seven of the last 29 NRL games. Mm-hmm. The last time the Warriors lost at Wynn Stadium was in 2013. Wow, that's shocking. They've won their two games there since. All up, though. They have three wins from 14 games at Wynn Stadium. Oh. I think the Warriors will <clears throat> uh, will pretty much walk through them, hey? Yeah. I'm I'm expecting big things from the Warriors in this game. Yeah. Uh, Eels versus Dolphins. The third try that gets scored in this game will be the 100th Premiership try in games played in the Northern Territory. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh Parramatta have won just one of their last eight games outside of New South Wales, which was round 17 last year, and on that occasion they also beat the Dolphins. I think the Dolphins will win. Um, yes, I do too. I think, I think they they're due a decent sized win as well. So I think they might they might put the sword to the ears a little bit. Hmm. I'm just not being convinced by anything Parramatta's doing at the moment. Nothing at all. Nothing. They're hanging on. They're just yeah. hanging on. Um, Panthers versus the Tigers. <laughs> the uh, Fergo and the Freak Cup on the line. It is. Who will win the Fairy the Bowl? The Tigers when they've been higher on the ladder than them. What's that? <laughs> and said so Penrith have won nine of their last 16 games against the Tigers when Penrith have been higher on the ladder. Okay. The Tigers have considered 18 points per game over their last four matches and Penrith have considered 19.5 in their last four games. The the Tigers to win. Wow, that's bold. <laughs> look, that nah, look the Tigers. <laughs> they'll probably put in a pretty good performance. Um, but if they do a fall apart job, it could get ugly. But I think it'll be more along the lines of like they just make it hard for Penrith to win, but Penrith will win. Yeah, look, it's it is a weird one because. 
obviously the last two years, Penrith have undoubtedly been the best team in the comp, and the Tigers have been the worst. Have they, though? <laughs> and yet sorry. I had to. <laughs> and yet somehow they've not – there hasn't been absolute floggings between these games, and, and you'd think there should have been. You know, so have a look here. Last year, Tigers won 12-8. I think that was against the clear realist side again there. Let me check. Oh, no, he played. I don't know who was missing for that one. Um, Tigers won that 12-8. The game before that, Penrith won 18-16. 2021, Penrith won 30-16. The game before that, Tigers won 26-6. Uh, Penrith won 30 to 6 in 2020, and they won 19 to 12. Tigers won 30 to 4 in 2019. Penrith won 9 8 in 2019. That game was an absolute bludger. <laughs> but you see, there's there hasn't been the floggings that you would you would suspect when the best teams playing the worst. Yeah, they've been a bit of a grind. I don't think this is going to be much different. There's, I don't see the Tigers winning this, but. Uh, I'd, Penrith are quite a long way where they, away from where they need to be without Cleary there. So I don't think there's going to be... Like, if Penrith wins this, it'll be something like 22 to 16 or something like that. I don't think it's going to be uh, an avalanche of points or a big win or anything like that. And I don't think the Tigers will be disgraced because, I mean, that's the one thing the Tigers have been good at this year is they have been defensively, I'm going to say, impressive. Mm. They haven't had 30 points put on them yet this year, which is very, very good because it's not like they've been playing against a whole heap of minnows and crap sides. They've played against yeah. a few decent sides who know how to put points on, and they've held their own. I, I see that continuing. I wonder how the Panthers are going to come out after that really bad loss they had against the Seagulls a couple of weeks ago. Then they've had the bye. You know they've been smashed in training. And, you know, Ivan Cleary won't have been happy with that performance they put in. Um, no. That's the only thing that worries me in terms of the Tigers for this game is that, you know, and then you've got James Fisher-Harris who's just announced he's leaving and stuff. If if the tie, if the Panthers, sorry, come out breathing fire, it could get ugly for the Tigers. But we'll see what happens. I, I, I tend to think it'll just be a... A tough game for the Panthers to win, and they'll grind out the win. But we'll see. It's also not, not, not worthy that Galvin is back this week too. Yeah, very, very important to their team. That is. Can't um, wait to see him in Panthers colours next year, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was big Stefano. There you go. I mean, just, just take more Tigers players. Yeah, and Bateman too. We're going <laughs> to revitalise Bateman in New South Wales Cup. Um. Titans versus Manly. Titans have won seven of their last 22 NRL games at Seabus Stadium. The, and, Titans aren't, the Titans are a joke. I'm tipping Manly. And Manly have lost their last four games in Queensland with an average losing margin of 26 points. Holy shit, I'm tipping Manly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going with Manly to probably go close to putting 50 on here. Yeah, they could very easily do that, hey? Mm. This Titans team is just a... They're garbage. They are. Bring back the seagulls. Yeah, fuck it. In fact, bring bring back the giants. Bring back the giants. Yeah, absolutely. Because they were New South Wales based. That's probably why they were better. Gold Coast tweed heads. Yeah. Uh, Broncos v Raiders. The Broncos last win over. What have I got there? Why have I put the Roosters on there? I've not even done that stat right. Oh, well, forget that one then. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the Roosters for some reason. No one's picked That's up me. on that. Um. The Raiders were pretty good last week. I I, I actually thought they were pretty average. <laughs> I think I think the Broncos are gonna. Yeah. I think the Broncos are gonna write some. Um, the Broncos got Reese Walsh back. The, yeah, he was back last week. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so I think the Broncos are going to realign some of the expectations Ooh. that the Canberra Raiders have this yes. year. And I think yes. that's going to be a rude awakening. And Josh Papali is going to be like, man, I can't wait until I'm playing for Penrith next year. Exactly. How's that for some foretelling? Eh? We've nailed that one. Yep. Um, yeah, I think the Broncos are going to run up a 
quite a number of tries in this one. Speaking of tries being run up, Bulldogs v Knights. The last 160 minutes between these two sides have seen the Knights score 108 points to six. Oh, wow. Bulldogs have won 23 of their last 100 games. I've tipped the Bulldogs, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm not impressed with the Knights. I just But you're impressed impressed with the Dogs? I've seen some things out of the Bulldogs that I like, and, and I think that they're... I don't think they're too far away from being a team you've you you've really really got to beat. I like, don't think there's a game that I can think of in the last two or three years that I could give less of a shit about than this one. Really? See, I'm really looking forward to this game because no, nah, neither of these sides do anything for me. Okay, I'm I get just that. zero interest whatsoever, and because of that, I have no idea who's going to win this game. And to be honest. I don't care. So I'm going to tip a nil or draw. <laughs> <laughs> I I could I could see the I could see the Bulldogs smacking the Knights. That's the thing. It's the Bulldogs have shown glimpses of being a decent attacking side when they get it out to kick out, but at the same time, their defence just can't be fucked sometimes. And they just yeah. let, when they're when they're in the perfect position, they do all the hard work. They get in that perfect position, and then they just throw it away, just through bleh, whatever. Who gives a shit? And the Knights, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Like they, they'll come out one week and they'll put on a really good performance against a genuine side, and then the next week they'll lose against a side that should be running laps around. And you're like, they're like lightning. You don't know which yeah. what team's going to turn up every week. Yeah, and I I don't know how to get a measure on what they're doing. It's just. It's an absolute mystery. And so the Knights are going to get opportunities handed to them by the Dogs. They'll take half those opportunities and they'll piss the other ones up against the wall. And I don't know whether the Bulldogs have got enough in them to be able to capitalise on the Knights pissing up wall <laughs> or have enough defensive temerity to be a hold, a hold off the Knights when they're not pissing it up against the wall. It's just too many variables at play and none of them are good ones. And I'm just, I don't know. I don't know. Tell you what, I'll I'll go the Bulldogs. And you know what? I'll go the Bulldogs. 47 points to 19. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, How's that? That's, that's specific. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to put a points total on it, but I just think that Viliami Kikau, um ahead of his move to Penrith next year, is just going to be up for this game. <laughs> and I think that... Uh, I think that they're going to smash Cal and Ponga. That's my two predictions. Uh, all I'm going to say is you should go and put a dollar on 47 to 19 as a scoreline. I, I think that I've quit rugby league betting <laughs> after what happened last weekend with the Raiders. Yeah, well, that's that's probably fair. I think 47 to 19 for this game is a better bet than the one you made last week. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Why did I put any faith in the Raiders? So dumb. <sighs> Uh, the last game of the round, Sharks versus Cowboys. Sharks have won seven of their eight games against the Cowboys in the last decade at points bet. Oh, wow. And Cowboys have won nine of their 37 games outside of Queensland. I tipped uh, I tipped the Sharks just because the Cowboys are soft up the middle and, like, the Sharks game plan is pretty simplistic. It's pretty much up the middle of the park. So um, that's where I come come out with that one. And also, Tamalolo's going to probably take it easy ahead of his move to Penrith next year. So That, that Panthers depth is looking pretty impressive next year. We're going um, to have to buy some boats <laughs> and Harvey Norman vouchers. <laughs> Mate, I don't think you'll be able to afford the Harvey Norman vouchers. You're going to need those shit donated. Man, a, a, a $1,000 Harvey Norman voucher isn't buying you much, is it? <laughs> A microwave? It's, it's, yeah, it's... A microwave and a USB. I mean, if you want a good deal, you don't go to fucking Harvey Norman, do you? <laughs> oh, shit, no. <laughs> if you want one deal, you go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm picking the Sharks in this one. It'll, I reckon it'll probably be another, another typical Sharks-Cowboys high-scoring kind of game. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like the Sharks game last week, like 34-22, whatever it was. It'll be something like that. Yeah, I could see that. All right, well, we've got through that. It's been a good episode, Andrew. We've covered many different 
issues from different parts of the world. We've been to New Zealand. We've been through Australia. We headed over to Perth. We went up to Toulouse. We avoided England. It's been fantastic. We hit all the hotspots and missed all of the not hotspots. Exactly. And we managed to get through the whole episode, talk about all those places and didn't even mention Tamworth. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Ropes Creek for the win. I agree. Well, on that absolutely high note, let's wrap this one up. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Make sure you check out all the socials, like, subscribe everywhere you can, and we will catch you next time.